Okay. Okay, uh, thank you, Brother Lai. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, happy to come here and share with you some, some of the things that I've learned. Actually, this during COVID times, lah, okay? The COVID, two years COVID hibernation uh, has been a blessing in some ways because I got nothing much to do, isn't it? So basically, we just kind of like uh, sit down, <laughs> sit at home and use whatever we have at home, right? Not. So since young, I had been collecting a lot of books, uh, many books, in fact. I think, um, and just sitting there, you know, collecting dust. So I was thinking what to do with these things, you know, and like maybe when I die, I'll probably give it away to the Buddhist library or something like that. But it's quite silly, isn't it? I mean, it's all there and never read. So I thought COVID, who knows, who knew it would, it would last that long, right? Thought it was like one month or two months kind of thing. So it became a two-year thing. So it became a habit uh, to actually read the stuff that I have. And uh, I found that I had such great books. Seriously, you know, I didn't know I had such a good collection of books. So many. In fact, I shared this collection with uh, Dato Sri Victor V. Uh. He wanted to do some research on Buddhist travel or Buddhist tourism, I think, in uh, Southeast Asia. So he got me involved in that project. It's actually a, what call that, uh, a Taylor University's project. Okay. And uh, um, the United Nations World Tourist Organization right, uh, asked Dato Sri to help out in the Southeast Asia section and then he got me involved. And because of that, I had to do a lot of research, all right? And that's where I started uh, using my, my library, but that was before COVID. So when I started to discover my collection, then I started to learn more and more. And then I realized, you know, that there are so many things that um, we take for granted uh, in Buddhism. Seriously, we take for granted, okay? And after two years of reading, reading and reflecting on the materials that I have, then I realized, oh, I think some of these materials, I think should be shared uh, with the fellow community. Uh. You're the first batch. <laughs> okay, you're the first batch. And um, this is uh, uh, my first presentation on my research. All right, I hope you get entertained. Now, I was, there was a question uh, by one brother, Uya. Oh, uh, Chai, he heard of my talk and then he says, hey, you talk like this, uh, then you debunk some of the myth, will it like shake our faith or not? You know? I say, don't worry. It, will not only sh it won't shake, it will strengthen. And there's another misconception, Sada. Okay, Sada, we always look at it as the faith. All right? I just gave a talk to Babs uh, two weeks ago. That's also part of the research. Sada actually means Confidence with conviction. You might have confidence in something and then based on the confidence, you take action. That's what it means, you know, Sada. It's not faith like in the, you know, Christianity or Islam. Believe in the God or things like that and then you just, you know, give up, give up everything. That can lead to a blind faith, okay? Blind belief. But Sada is confidence with conviction. You're you confident in the, the teaching because you haven't practiced yet. Ma. You just hear about the teaching, then you practice, then you, you say, hey, this looks sounds good. Lah. But then you must practice. Once you practice, then whatever you think is good become a real, uh, that becomes your fruit. Then it's called sadha. No? Okay? So that's one of the first misconceptions uh, that, that I think most of us hold because we are so. I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say brainwash, lah, but we are so kind of like used to all this explanation lah, by which Western religion. Lah. Simply because our language is English. If we had our language, first language is in Chinese or in say, in Tamil lah, whatever, lah, Asian language, lah, you know, I don't think we, our mind will be thinking like this. But because our English, our language is English, then we, have, we read all this kind of stuff, you know, and all these uh, colonialism ideas are start to kind of like brainwash us. Lah. So we start to think like that, you see. And worse still, we're going to bring these ideas into Buddhism and define Buddhism based on that model. You know? Okay, so I guess um, we have to relook at how we understand religion uh, in terms of Buddhism. Uh, okay, so I digress a bit. So that was uh, how I got into research, right? How I got into research and I went, I went to study uh, mainly early Buddhists, early Buddhists and early Buddhism. Okay. 
not so much on the later ones, uh, the early Buddhists. Uh. The early Buddhists means uh, um, we look at the how Buddha's teaching changed over time, over time, okay, and changed to what we practice like this now, right? So I was I was interested in the first two to three hundred years from the Buddha's Parinibbana until Asoka. Uh, that was the time I thought that was an interesting thing because we have very little information how it developed, you know, during. So I'm going to um, go into the era, the early Buddhist and early Buddhism era, okay? And uh, some, uh, what call this? Uh? I'm going to talk about uh, some, uh, let me see what do we have here. Hey, how to use this? Uh? This one, uh, is it? Sorry, yeah. Uh? Technology, no good. Uh? Oh. Hey, don't have also. Oh, this one. Oh, that one. Okay. Okay. Before I, I, um, I, I, what is uh, I go into the the topic of the Buddhist research that I'm working on. I want to talk about why, what this, what is the latest Buddhist research and how it is actually um giving uh, new new findings. You know, now apparently um I'm looking at the research since two thousand or two thousand and ten. We're not talking about research during Rhys Davis days, you know, all right, at, at the turn of the 20th century, you know, 1900s, early 1900s, or even before World War II, when most of the uh, Pali texts uh, were translated into English. Then after that, there was a very, very uh, heavy uh, activi research activities until the 1950s, 1960s, mostly by very uh, educated Indians, uh, all right? But then these are all uh, Western trained, um, I would say Victorian kind of like um, trained academicians. Uh. So they were very influenced by the British, British ideas, you know, uh, British uh, what is it, universities and um, theological ideas, Christian theological ideas, right? Now, uh, towards, I noticed then after there was a lull. When you buy books, you know, you know, certain time, uh, wow, many books come out. Then certain time, no book come out. Then certain time, another batch of books come out. I was in publishing industry, so I can see this pattern one, right? So um, then at, until the 1950s, the late about 70s, uh, then it kind of like, you know, wavered because I think probably they say there's nothing much to research. Uh. From 2000 onwards, there's another wave. Now this wave, uh, the, 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 the year 2000 onwards, the wave uh, is more holistic, like I would say more intradisciplinary and interdiscipline. When we say intradiscipline means within various Buddhist tradition, Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrapanya, okay? And then also between the uh, South Indian, South, uh, Indian subcontinent uh, religion, Hinduism, Brahminism, and Jainism, okay? So it's between this, uh, call it, call it uh, interfaith kind of comparison. But then they also use, uh, interdisciplinary tools, you know, like philology. Philology means uh, it's like a structure to study uh, language, okay? Archaeology, linguistic, and social anthropology. So not necessarily they look at religion itself, but they look at the society culture, where this religion comes from. So they study actually Indo Indian, Indian society, okay? They call it Indology. La. When you say Indology means that uh, they study society as a whole, no? including culture, including their, their lifestyle and things like that. So we study um, aspects of this. You need not be involved in religion. You just study the social aspect. Okay. So there was a lot of research going on for the last uh, 100 years, uh, especially in, uh, in, uh, in, in Indology. Okay. Then um, some of these researchers, they are not trained in, say, archaeology. Some of these are trained in, say, uh, uh, engineering. Some of them are trained as scientists. Then after that, they got so fed up with that, then they go and do their master's or PhD uh, in, in Sanskrit, for instance, or in Pali, for instance, you know. So they had a background in traditional uh, field of study, uh, with engineering and, and things like that. Then they move on, all right, to, to, to areas of uh, more like Indian religion. Now, it's good in that sense because uh, you, 
you can start to basically uh, use skills from another area and use that skill to investigate in a totally new area, okay, and see it from a totally different perspective. All right. So many of these uh, studies, uh, the new researchers are all like that, you know. Okay, so they got a, a few a skill set and they apply in, example, uh, Buddhist, Buddhist uh, uh, what is uh, the religion. Now, this sort of inter interdisciplinary approach actually is called out of the box kind of in investigation. You do not sit in the box and then keep on looking in and in, in and out, uh, inside the box. You, you try to find out other things outside the box to try to investigate what's inside the box. And you start to see that you see things from a different perspective. Okay. So what we have now is that more in depth, the, the, the studies are not more in depth, they are richer, they have more detailed comparative studies, and more importantly, they use new technology okay, to, wait, to, do, to, do the, to do the investigation. This is actually important in archaeology. When you have all this radioactive uh, uh, what is, uh, uh, dating, and even let's say you got uh, let's say a mummified specimen of monks, lah, like date for hundreds of years, you know. Uh, they try to use some DNA if available to do, you know, to try to get information out of it. Okay. Some people say, hey, Buddha got tooth, is they got tooth relic, but why not get DNA from that? You know, it's fair out. But DNA got a life uh, shelf span. Maybe up to 500 years only. So Buddha died 2,500, 2,600. Not possible to get the DNA. Lah. Okay. It would be interesting lah, actually yeah, if you get the DNA uh, to see what kind of being is that, you know, right? So this is where Buddhist research have evolved over the years. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the background. Lah. So for today, uh, I, I just want to use one, one research from one guy. And uh, it, he epitomizes. What I said just now, he does. He did not graduate in the in in as a Pali scholar or a Sanskrit scholar, or even as the Indology scholar. He's actually a public administration graduate from the University of Philippines. All right, totally different. But I think he, he uh, what called is um he uh, he decided to retire in nineteen ninety five and then dedicate himself, you know, to study um, Indian language. Okay, I'll give a bit background about this guy lah. His name is S. Kalyana Raman, all right? At first, uh, today's talk, I wanted to talk about two, two, two research, S. Kalyana Raman and then the Brian Leffman and Johannes Bronkers. But I thought, uh, um, because this, this area is very new, uh, if I go in too much, uh, it will scatter your attention, you know? So I, I, today, I decided I'll leave the second one for another talk. I'll focus on the S. Kalyana Raman. And uh, if I give more detail, I think it's very interesting. You find it very interesting. Okay. Who's this guy? Kayana Raman. That's his picture. He's still alive. Okay. He's the chair of the Taksha Indic Sarawasti Sindhu Civilization. Um, he studies, uh, what is it? He said, what, uh, the, the TISSC is one of the units of the Taksha Initiative of the World Ancient Tradition. All right. So uh, they study the different aspects of Indian civilization. Okay. Um, he actually, he got his PhD as the public admin from the University of Philippines. But after that, he, he began, you know, he, he began to distance himself from, from public service and started to devote his attention to research on Indian civilization since his retirement in 1995. As you can see, uh, he's uh, well versed in a few languages, lah. Kannada, Telugu, Hindi, Sanskrit, and Tamil languages. All right. He's an author of 16 books on Sarawasti civilization, including the Epigraphia Indoscript, Hypertext, and Comparative Dictionary of 25 Ancient Bharatiya Languages. I have his book, The Indus Script Cipher. All right, and from that book, I got to know more detail about him. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about his work on, 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 um, on Indian symbols, but I'm gonna focus on his work on Buddhist symbols. Because we, we talk about Indian symbols a lot, uh, too many. So I, I, I focus on what, he's, what he found out on the Buddhist symbol. Uh, okay. Now, just to tell you, uh, okay. Um, every ancient civilization did not start with the writing, writing style. 
They start with um, some pictorial method. An example this one. This is, uh, you all know, lah, Egyptian writing, lah, correct or not? It's called the helogryph, Egyptian helogryph. So what they do is that they use uh, carve uh, pictures of animals or objects, and then uh, what is, uh, people try to string it into a sentence. That's how the ancient people communicated. And uh, two, two of these hero groups uh, has been decoded. The ancient Egyptian ones and the Sumerian. The Egyptian one is the most famous. Okay, they managed to decode it. All right, so let's start off with this first because, because this is very important because some, we start with something which, which is familiar. You are you all familiar with in, uh, Egyptian uh, hieroglyphs and this is how it looks like. But did you know that uh, in India had a very ancient civilization, they call it the Indus civilization, all right? And they themselves had their own hieroglyphs like this, okay? Uh, these are all the Indus Valley civilization, right? Which existed some 5,000 years ago, okay? It started in Northwest India and Pakistan, all right? And in this area, they had their own method of writing. They call it the hieroglyphs of Indus Valley Civilization or the Harappa script, okay? Unfortunately, it's not decoded because unlike the uh, Egyptian, uh, they got more consistent writing, no? Yeah, I mean the pictures, uh, pictures or the carving, uh, whatever you call it, all this. Can I use this, uh, this one? Pointer, how do you do the pointer? Huh? Got red, man? Oh, red one, oh. Uh, you see all this, all this carving here? All right, all these lines here got meaning on, you know? So all these are very obvious, la. elephant, la, tiger, la, you know? Bull, all this kind of thing is very obvious. Swastika, one of the earliest uh, Buddhist, uh, what called this, uh, Indian symbol, all right? All these, all these lines are, unfortunately, uh, they were not very consistent. Okay, so they, they could not decode as well as the, uh, compared to the Sumerian or the Egyptian. Uh. But this guy, as Kalyana Raman tried, he claims to have decoded. But I went to do a comparative research from other academicians in India. He, they debunk him. They debunk him. Okay. But uh, all I'm saying is uh, he's not 100% uh, because Indian, uh, sometimes uh, they're very boastful. Uh, they say, oh, I've done everything, you know. But they actually, they never do, <laughs> you know. When they do peer review, uh, peer re research, and then they say, oh, this guy actually do need 50%, example. The other 50% not, not, not there yet. But in his book, he claimed he do already, okay? So sometimes when you read uh, some of these books, you must do comparative uh, research, lah, you know, on, his, on their findings. But I was interested in his uh, results on Buddhist decoding, the decoding the Buddhist glyphs, all right? So I, I went and went and researched more on his work on the Buddhist glyph, okay? So we got this idea, there's the Hindu civil, Valley civilization existed about 5,000 years from the Gandhara Valley, Northeast Pakistan. Okay, this is the cradle of India civilization. Okay, so unfortunately, Gandhara now is in Pakistan, and Pakistan being Muslim country uh, is uh, terrible, uh, right? In the sense of um, not appreciating their rich culture, no. But this is like you know their their cradle of their Indian civilization, you know. Okay, so um, okay, let's let's. I'm going to now you get an idea. First, you have a. The Egyptian hieroglyphs, and then you now know there is an Indian hieroglyphs, but it comes, they call it the Indus Valley. Right? I will focus on one symbol. All right. There is that there, there is practically uh what is uh, focus on Buddhism. Okay. Okay, before that, uh, before that, uh, I, um okay, again, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh. Now we need to decode this, isn't it? It's just a uh, some words and some, some lines and some animal pictures, right? We need to decode this. So I want to kind of like a, um, explain a bit uh, how they decode, what process they use to decode, what method they use to decode, okay? Um, the method of decryption is called the rebus method, all right? Rebus means uh, a representation of words or syllables by pictures or objects or by symbols whose names 
resemble the intended words or syllables in sound. You played the game before, share it. Right? Two syllable. Okay? Like for instance, Buddhist club. How do you do Buddhist club? First you do like that. Then you say like that, like that. Don't know what. Then you say, oh, Buddha, Buddha. Then after Buddhist, right? Club. How do you do? Very difficult to. Uh, there you see. Uh, brother, she saying club. <laughs> but this club is not the idea of club that we know. Like membership, community. Club is a weapon. But the word, the, the, the sound club is the same. So when we play the word share it, Buddhist club. Ah, correct. But the, 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 the object you use was not totally different. Correct or not? Same spelling, same sound. So that's what reverse means. Okay? Reverse means you paint an object and then that particular sound that you use to utter to describe the object represents the actual meaning. So if you play share it, you know what the reverse means. Huh? That's, how it did, that's how they did it. Huh? Okay? Uh, please come, join. So what he does, what he did was he, he was he used the reverse method and then applied to a South Asia lexicon of uh, with a database of eight thousand semantic clusters, all right, of Indian languages, and um, that's how he this was his method. There's pro and con, of course, all right. Number one, then you must know the source language lah. You must understand, you no know, Buddha during that time uh, spoke Magadhi Prakit, you know, all right. In that in that era, in the area area Magadha, he spoke the word Prakit, Magadhi Prakit or Magahi. Okay, that language is dead already. But Pali is drawn from Magadhi Prakit, and today uh, we have Pali because it actually the source language is from there. Lah. So what he did was he used Magadhi Prakit, tried, he got a lexicon of Magadhi Prakit, the sounds. Uh, all right, and from there, you know, he said, okay, this is how they decipher this picture, and it came out to be this meaning. Okay, so you must understand it's not Pali, it's not uh, Telugu, it's not Hindi, but Prakrit, pra, Magadi Prakrit. That was his source language. Okay, and unfortunately, some of the things that we cannot double check because Magadi Prakrit is very hard to find, uh. it's hardly found in, in, in the internet. All right, so we take his word for it uh, in that sense. Uh. Okay. So um, the first thing is to do, uh, identify the method of decryption. So he used the reverse method. The second one, uh, equally important was, who was the authority uh, to decide that a club is like that? Who? Just now was Brother Chi Sing, right? How, do you, how did you come up with a club? It's based on experience. Uh. Whatever you know, you play the game before, you use it before, you know the club got two meaning, club as in membership and club as in a, a, a tool, okay? A, a sports tool. So you, you know, and you, you, because of you doing that, you are the artisan. Okay, you are the artisan. So the artisan was not the king, the artisan was not the president or what, the artisan was brother T, who is, in, who is responsible for recording this talk. So can you imagine that this is the example I'm, I'm using. Brother T today is responsible for recording this talk. And he decided the club looks like this. Not that of Sir Victor V. Okay, not Tan Ho Chai or whoever, but Brother T. So when the when we talk about carving this, this uh, reverse, uh, I mean carving the stones or making the coins or whatever, uh, it was the artisans who decided, okay, this picture represents this sound. And who were these artisans? They were the masonaries, the carpenters, the miners, and the metalsmith. Very powerful people, you know. Oh, the lapidaries. Okay. So these people were the craft masters of those days. You must imagine uh, uh, during those days, uh, who were the wealth creators? <coughs> wealth creators, uh, I would say. Uh, okay. Like today, who are the wealth creators? Financial guys, isn't it? Who, who knows all this finance, right? They know how to play the market and things like that. Financial people. Or coders. Correct, right? Who are the wealth makers? Coders who know how to do programming language. And then who know how to use the internet to disseminate their tools. Okay? Those days, the wealth makers of these 
mason carpentry because they know how to make buildings and they know how to make metal, metal tools. Those days, metal is for what? Uh, maybe axe, la, arrow. La. And who are the biggest users of this? Army, isn't it? The king. The king need a big army, ma, right? Not. So when you have a big army, what you need? You need arrows. You need uh, shields. Huh? You need only, not only for the, the helmets, not only for the soldiers, but also for the horses and elephants. Correct? So the metal smith, the masonries, the carpenters were the wealth creators during the time. Okay? And they had a big say, you know, on how uh, these carvings and these coins uh, come out. All right? And not only they had a say, they also decided on the technique that is used. Whether it's copper, whether it's zinc, whether it's gold, silver, they had a say in all that. All right? So there are two, two, two main important things here when you talk about hilogris. One is the method. How do you dis, dis, decrypt it? Uh, first, they use the reverse method. And then number one is identify the artisans. Okay? Now, we know their method already. Let's go into the uh, Buddhist symbol that became prominent during this time. Buddhist hilogris, not Indian anymore. Okay, Buddhist hilogris. What is the famous one? All right. Um, uh, let's let's go through all these. Uh. <clears throat> okay. Buddhist hilogris are any iconic symbols. During at one time, uh, between Buddha passed away, Buddha's parinibbana, and uh, until the turn of the new century. All right. Um, about five hundred years. Uh, there was no Buddha rupa like this one. Uh, don't have. Because it was forbidden. Buddha said, ah, do not make an image of me. But we're going to do like that. Okay? Buddha himself said, no need, don't do. You want, to, you want to pay homage to me, go visit the places I've been to, you know, maybe put flower on my, you know, places where, where I've been, things like that. So, uh, but then he said, you can uh, represent me la, in a few things. La. We will explain later. La, okay? So, um, the, the time during before, uh, the, uh, during when the Buddha passed away, until the time about uh, four five hundred years ago, four hundred five years later, all the Buddhist represent Buddha's representation were called aniconic. They were basically icons and symbols. All right. So what are they? They are throne, empty throne, body body tree, riderless horse, parasol floating above empty space. You know. Buddha's footprint, Dharma wheel, Maya's dream, Great Departure, Mara Sete, Enlightenment, Buddha Pichit. They were all like this to me. So imagine at uh, the time, uh, how, to, how to share Dharma? You know, if you are Buddhist at the time, uh, how do you share Dharma? Now we say, oh, I'll give you Buddha image. This Buddha. Straight away, you say, oh, Buddha. Correct or not? But at the time, don't have. Buddha, someone, Buddha said, cannot. All right? So they use all these symbols and all these uh, graphics. But as you can see here, uh, between an empty throne and a Bodhi tree, if you are a Buddhist and trying to introduce Buddhism to uh, somebody who is new to the religion, one day you show him empty throne. Tomorrow, show him Bodhi tree. As the new me, new bee, how will you feel? A tree, are you? Yesterday, you talked about empty seat. Today, you talked about tree. What religion is this? <laughs> Correct or not? So, so, it was very difficult, you know, and... Everybody was like, oh, yeah, how, to, how to share the Dharma like that? Correct or not? But it has been going on like that. So the artisans created a lot of these carvings. If you go to Sanchi or Amaravati or even Bodh Gaya, you're on the, on, the, on the side of the stupa, you know, you have all these carvings. Some of these carvings are very old, you know. So you have this kind of carving, like, riderless horse, you know, parasol floating, like, Mara attack, like, the great departure. All these things uh, were done. Were done uh, during the era when. So I think after that, uh, um, somebody said, probably somebody realized uh, we need something standard. Uh, correct or not? And yet, uh, they don't, don't want to go against what the Buddha said. Do not make image of me. Okay? Now, then came that one particular image. All right? They represented Buddha and his teachings. And what is this called? It's called the tree ratna. All right? Tree ratna. Let's go through this. It was the McDonald icon of early Buddhism. All right? For four to five hundred years, uh, it was one, one icon 
that epitomized what Buddhism was all about. I think you all never heard before, I think Tri Ratna. Tri Ratna, you know, it's triple gem, Tri Ratana, okay, Tri Ratna. But you have never seen it before, I think. No, not, not many of you have seen it, you know. It's forgotten, no? But imagine that during that time, it was the icon, you know, Buddhist icon, no, during the time. Okay, I'll show you afterwards. Very interesting story, this one. Okay. If you go to Sanchi, Amaravati, Barhut, Bogaya, Anuradhapura. Anuradhapura is in Sri Lanka, okay? If you go to these this ancient places, you will see the symbol. Especially Sanchi. Huh? The Sanchi, the gate, I think the north, north gate or something like that. Torana, Torana. On top of the gate, they have this put there, okay? And not only they found in stupas, they are also embedded in coins, you know? Okay? This, this symbol was embedded in coins. And these coins uh, were used by the Kulina kingdom, the indo Scythian kingdom, the Indo-Greek kingdom, and also found in Taxila. Uh, all right? I'll give all the graphics. Then you will see how this, how this uh, symbol became so prevalent. Okay? So this is the Sanchi. If you go to Sanchi, I'm sure you see this before, lah. But you must look up, lah. It's the, one of the gate, the north gate. Okay. You go Amaravati, and you see this symbol. All right. And you go to say uh, Gandhara, and you see this symbol. We're talking about this one here. This one. Okay. This one. This is called the tree right now. Huh? This is called the tree right now. Right, one to here. So this is very uh, common in all these uh, old, old uh, these are ancient ancient locations. Uh. These are the carvings, and these are the coins. Okay, so in the Greek king, between ninety to eighty five BC, you you see you see it here. Okay, yeah. then sorry. Where are the jewels? Jewels? Three jewels, right? But where, where are the jewels? There are three. La. One, two, three. La. Can you see or not? Okay. Wait, I'll, I'll show you here. There, can you see? Ah, ah magic, ah, technology. <laughs> okay. Just, just put a box there and suddenly it's so obvious. Correct or not? Now, these are the coins of different empires. Okay, the Indo Greek king, look at the date, huh? look at the date, 90 to 85 BC, you know, BC, before uh, Christian era. Then the Kunina coin is 200 to 300 BC, you know, right? And uh, the Aziz is 48 to 25 BC. Then this Taxila coin is 185 to 168 BC. So we're talking about um, 200 years after Buddha passing away, and all these coins start to appear over a period of 200 years. Okay, and you have, and you can see different kingdom, the symbol is the same, right? The symbol is the same, Tirana, 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 same. So you imagine uh, how old is McDonald? McDonald is what, 60 years old, 70 years old? Not too long, isn't it? But it looks like a lifetime, you know. We're talking about here, 200 years, you know, 300 years, you know, okay? Right? So you look at the scale of things. Lah. Sometimes we, we're thinking like, you know, ah, this like ancient story not long ago, you know, not long time. But you make a comparison to what we are experiencing today. This is actually a very long time. It's a long time. Okay. Uh, the Kushan Empire. All right. And you can see there, Kushan Empire. All right. And from Anandpu region, Andhra Pradesh, which is a bit south already. And then you can see the, the markings here. But it's a bit blur. La. So what they did, they did a drawing. Okay. So in conclusion, if you are king, and if you are a, a rich man during those days, and you can afford to make your own coin or do your own carving, uh, chances are a tree ratna symbol will be seen. Okay, a tree right now symbol will be seen. 
<laughs> okay. Right. Can I move on? Okay, no. <laughs> now, I put a timeline here. Then you will know. You can see the sequence. Okay. Buddha Pari Nibbana 483 BC. The next king uh, who was single handedly uh, responsible uh, for making Buddhism a global religion is Asoka. Incidentally, the three Ratna symbol came during his period. He was the one who built the Sanchi Stupa. You know, correct or not? Uh, but Sanchi Stupa was not built all at once during one time. Uh. He started it, but it took a few hundred years to complete, you know. So the three Ratna at Sanchi's gate, uh, North Gate, we do not know whether it was built during Asoka time or not. We don't know. But we know for sure, we know for sure that the three Ratna came about during his time. Okay. Uh, you must understand, uh, Asoka was the only king in India who managed to have a kingdom uh, as big as India today. No other kingdom uh, came near as him. The British Empire united India as one continent as we know of today, lah, including Pakistan and Bangladesh. Lah, okay? But imagine, you know, Asoka in 232, around that 304, 232, he, he had an area you know, as big as that. I said for the south part, the little part of the south that he, he did not conquer. Okay? So his influence was very strong and he had a united view of things. During those days, uh, you, you, are only, you, you are only loyal to the king. When the king say like that, everybody must follow. Therefore, uh, he was very powerful because he had, he had all the warlords under him. Imagine you know, all the small, small, India is so big, you know, and all the warlords are under him. Okay? And he had the uh, what is uh, He had this uh, power. So imagine the wealth he had. Just now we're talking about the wealth creators, isn't it? Artisans, the smith, the uh, metal smith, the wood covers, the masonries, all this were at his disposal. Okay. So when he said, I want to do this, why wow, everybody follow? And everybody have a standard template. Everybody do the same thing. Okay. So he started, um, he started using three right now as a symbol of Buddhism. Okay. Now, after the Maoya Empire fell, which Asoka was king, all right, and um, the next one that came along was uh, the Indo-Greeks king, okay, in 1980-85. Now, you, I, I won't go through in detail uh, all this, uh, all this, uh, what this uh, time, time period. Between Buddha's party Nibbana to the Kushan era, where you find this uh, tree runner here. How many years is that? Almost five to 600 years. Correct or not? Majority of which uh, this period is the Aniconic era. That means that this period, uh, they promoted Buddhism without a Buddha Rupa. Can you imagine that? Without Buddha Rupa, no? Okay? But towards this end, around this time, uh, around this time, the Buddha Rupa started to appear already. Okay? So those days, they use a lot of symbols. They use a lot of symbols. To get an idea uh, how, how great these empires were, uh, keep in mind, uh, okay, you have uh, the Moya Empire, Asuka, you have Mananda here, then you have the Indo Scythian here, and you have the Kushan here and the Kuninda here. Okay? Let's look at their empire. Uh. This is how big the Moya Empire was. This is, uh, what this, uh, this is uh, Asuka's empire. Okay? Uh, his uh, capital is at uh, this uh, Pat Pataliputra. Pataliputra here. Incidentally, Pataliputra is in the Magadha area. And this is the area where Buddha was circling, circulating. Okay? Circulating. Another uh, area that you should be interested in is Taksila here. Okay? Taksila. Because down here, you look at this, all these are Himalaya, no? Himalaya. And all these are all the mountain range. There's only one little pass here that you can go through from India to the north. Okay? Link up, linking up to Central Asia and China. Okay? This is called the Khyber Pass. All right? Khyber Pass. That's where all the invading forces from Greek, from the Persia, will come and try to attack India. La. India is watching it because they got this Himalaya blocking, except for this Khyber Pass area. Okay? 
So you must so imagine uh, they all it's all ringed by the all, all the empire uh, are ringed by what is the physical physical border uh, that is a uh, kind of like you know limit the 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 the, the, the what that, uh, the, the kingdom size. Okay, so this is this is Moya Empire. Okay, this is the Indo Greek Empire. All right, Indo Greek Empire. Okay, this is where the Menanda King Menanda is. Again, look where they are located up here. All right, and also uh, access through the Khyber Pass. And this is the Indo Scythian. Okay, here. Again, up north, northwest here, all linked to Tiber Pass. Okay, this is Kodinda, it's a small little kingdom here. Okay, quite insignificant. And this is again the Kushan Empire. So you can see down here, I put the coins. Uh, you see the coin here? I associate the coins with the empire, right? The coins with the empire. Okay. I, I want to bring this highlight to you because there is a significant uh, relation uh, between, between these coins and how Indian Buddhism spread from India to North uh, to Central Asia and then to China. I mentioned just now Khyber Pass. And you notice all the image empire is on this Northeast area. Okay, now um, uh, this is a link. There, up there, here, do you see here? This is where, uh, this is where the, the Silk Road epicenter is. Central Asia, okay? All traders from China and the East links up this, through this area as, as they march towards Europe, and the Europeans do the same thing likewise towards China. So that is the uh, epicenter, okay? And from here, you can see that all this empire were there, correct or not? Around the same area, right? It started from Asuka time, okay? So do you see the link? When Asuka started creating these three Ratna symbols, through carvings, and then they alter through coins. And then these coins uh, were adopted by all these later on empires, you know, the Indo-Greeks, the Indo-Scythians, and then the Kushan Empire, they carry on. And then this kingdom, they were Buddhists, they were Buddhist kings, okay? And they added in the three Ratna as, as they are into their coins. Now, Somebody was saying, uh, how come Buddhism are uh, not like Christian? Uh, so, so hip. Uh. When I was young, right? People say, wow, Christian are uh, so hip. Uh. Come Buddhist temple, very boring. Uh. I go to church better. Uh, you know? I remember when I was young, I went to the common class, right? And one of the members said, because we wear very flimsy one, or wear like this one, Buddhist. Don't wear nice one, go to temple, uh, simply wear, wear floppies, uh, you know? He said, have you, then he told me, hey, Brother Lim, uh, you are president of this Buddhist society. Uh, look at how they dress, you know, UKM. Uh. Simply dress, no wonder boys don't get the girls or girls don't get the boys. Uh, okay. Have you been to church or not? I've not been to church, why should I go? No, we go to church, he said. Not to listen to Jesus. Look at how they dress, the young people. The guitars they bring, okay. You know, the girls, they put up makeup on, you know. Oh, Buddhists don't put makeup on, I say. The Buddha say don't put makeup on, right? Five percent, ma, eight percent, ma. No, oh, you see, that's how you, you get the community lively, you know. Boys dress up at their best, Sunday best, okay? And the girls dress up. And they had a great time. Go to church after prayers, then go have fun. Go eat, lah. Which is true, you know. Sometimes uh, I... I some, um, sometimes go for lunch when I was younger days uh, in McDonald's, you know, those days don't have big, big malls, uh, they go to McDonald's, uh, you know, and they do Bible study, you know, during lunchtime. They dress up very nicely. And then the whole McDonald's full of them, Christians. Uh, then nearby I got church, right? Then I realized, oh, that's what fellowship is about. 
They had a great time praying together in the church. Then after that, they had a great time having fellowship, eating, and Bible studying at McDonald's. Where we Buddhists come and say quiet, quiet, nobody say hello to you, right? Say sadu, sadu, go back, hide away, behind, go away. Nobody know your name. Okay? Um, it was hip. Being Christian was hip. Lah. Why? Because uh, the West was rich. China was not a strong power those days. Ma. Those days, Asian was so poor. Malaysia was so poor. The West was rich. Okay? America, Europe, Australia, everybody want to go to these kind of places. All right? The West was rich. English was the lingua franca of the world. Television full of English movies and films. And we watch them. And we want to follow them. Fashion, food, everything Western. Why am I bringing this up? Because from the time of Buddha birth up to 500 years after that, Central Asia, Northeast, West, Northwest India was a powerhouse. Wealth, richness, all the kings were there. This timeline, you saw just now, this timeline. The Kushan, the Indo-Sikians, Menander, Kuninda, Asuka, hundreds of years after the Buddhas passed away, they were mighty empires and all centered around the area, Northwest, the Gandhara area, Pakistan. And who were, when the king were running this, these areas, they were, they were wealthy, rich. Who were the wealth makers? Metalsmith, artisans, carpenters, you know. They were the one, no, imagine no, a pool of all these uh, skilled workers, you know, creating all this wonderful art, all these wonderful tools. And they make a lot of money. Okay? So they had a lot of wealth. And then, oh, when, you, when you have big kingdom, you have wealthy people, who were the transmitter of the wealth? Let's go back to the Silk Road. Okay? Who were the transmitter of the wealth? Traders. Okay? So you have, once you have produced a lot of things, you must sell. Ma. Who take advantage? Traders. So Indian traders were rich. And who are these Indian traders? They were Buddhists and Jains, you know, not Hindus. Buddhists and Jains because the king were Buddhists. So most of these traders were, uh, traders were Buddhists. And when they used coins to trade, right? And the coins issued by who? All these kings, uh, correct or not? And they, when they go onto the Silk Road and they started bartering and exchanging using some of these coins, and lo and behold, what happens? Chinese trader, Greek trader, you know, Persian trader, get this coin. You say, oh, came from where are you? You are India. Oh, who is this? Uh? My king. What is this symbol? Oh, great teacher, Buddha. Okay? And that's how Buddhism spread that way. To one simple icon, which is the tree right now. Okay? I, I use the word, the McDonald of his time. Okay, before that, they have multiple kind of any iconic symbols in it. You got parasol, what Maya dream now, this kind of thing. Correct or not? But now, no, they have only this tree, tree right now. Okay, I will explain later lah, how what this tree right now is, uh, is all about. But for now, uh, it's suffice enough to say that this particular symbol carried the Buddhist idea, the Buddhist teaching uh, from India throughout throughout the world, through the Silk Road. So some people say, you know, uh, India spread through monks. And of course, traders. Lah. But they cannot just use mouth. Ma. Correct or not? There must be something that people can hold on to. And now you can see the coins. All right? And it's probably some carvings. Lah. Small carvings of uh, what call that? the tree right now. In the small stones and things like that. They start to share. Okay? So people learn about Buddhism. Eh? Uh, through this way, okay? Now you know how uh, symbols are so important no? in communicating ideas, especially abstract ideas like religion. You need a concrete symbol, a very, very powerful symbol. I am surprised the tree right now did not become uh, 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 the symbol that is identified with Buddhism, like the cross to Christianity, like the crescent moon to Islam. We don't have. We ask her, what is a Buddhist symbol? What? None of us. 
we don't have. Maybe the wheel, lah, Dharma wheel. Okay? That also is recent, but initially it was the tree right now. It's not the wheel. Okay? But, they, but again, uh, you must understand, no, Buddhism was killed off in India. Unfortunately, the tree right now was, was similar to another Hindu symbol. They call it the Nandi Pada. Nandi Pada is a bull. Okay? Symbol of the bull. And it's an early Buddhist Hindu, sorry, early Hindu symbol. So when the Hindus, the Brahmins killed, killed Buddhism, uh, they said, ah, this particular one is called Nandi Pada, which is the bull. And they probably just a reason uh, why it did not pick up. Uh, okay? So it turned into a wheel. So we are Buddhist, we Buddhists are a bit unfortunate. Uh, all right? Okay, why is this tree right now? Uh, this tree right now here. So the tree right now is composed of actually uh, a flower within a circle. Here, all right? A flower within a circle. Oh, sorry. Okay, a flower within a circle. A diamond rod here. Diamond rod. Uh, Ananda chakra. This is Ananda chakra here. Okay. Uh, and the tree da, a tree a tree sula with three branches here. One, two, three. Representing the uh, three, four jewels of Buddhism, Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. Now, this is the ornate, ornate version uh, where you can see in Sanchi. Okay. Um, okay. In detail, it's like this. Okay. Um, these wings of this trident uh, is actually representing of two rivers in the, from Indus Valley. The Indus Valley had two rivers running through no? the, Gan the Ganga Valley, call it, uh, uh, Yamana and Ganga. Now, these are two holy rivers in India lah, because they, are, they, they cover the Indus civilization, the cradle of Indian civilization in the sub subcontinent. So these two rivers kind of like, you know, represent a kind of borders that, that, that area. Lah. So one side is the Yamana and the other side is the Ganga. This is the Yamana and this is the Ganga. Okay. Down here, the central here, all right, is called the uh, Pelerogram. You slice it into half, uh, okay? This one mirrors exactly the, to the other one, okay? And the, uh, these are the four corners here. It represent the four four assembly, all right? The monks, nuns, laymen, and women, okay? So this tree here represents the triple gem, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, okay? And this is also called the Trident, right? The Vajra rod here, you know, these people are Indian, right? Before they became Buddhists, I'm sure they were Brahmins, okay? So they, they use some Indian symbolism. Indra is a king of heaven. So they regarded Hasuka or the king as a king of heaven, okay? Then down here is the Dharma Chaka, representing the noble A4 path, okay? And in the middle is the lotus. Uh, it declares the Buddha's purity, all right? So down here, you have the Trisula, the Trident, the Vajra rod, diamond rod, and down here is the Dhamma Chakra. And this is actually how, what makes the triple, uh, what is this, uh, the, the tree, tree, tree right now. So one symbol, it explains everything about Buddhism. Okay? You have triple gem, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. Correct or not? The Sangha is for four, four, four assembly. Okay? Monks, nuns, lay people, lay women. Okay? And it's supported by Dhamma. All right. What is the Dhamma? No four noble truth. Okay. And no uh, noble eightfold path. And then you have this uh, lotus, the purity. Okay. The purity of Buddha. So just one symbol, you know, it summarized Buddha's teaching already. And that's how the people who carry this symbol uh, throughout from India to, to North Asia and through the uh, Silk Road explain Buddhism. Okay, explain Buddhism. Right. Now, this is just a map. Uh. I did this with Bante Damika. Uh. I spent months on doing this. This is Yamuna River, and this is the Ganga River. So, this is the left side, and this is the right, uh, this is the right side, and this is the left side of the Trident. This one. Here. Ganga, Yamuna. Okay. In between here, is the Indus civilization. That's where civilization India started here. 
All right? And this whole area here is where the Buddha walked. Every part of this Buddha has come before. Kesaputa, Besali, Ukachara, Kusinara, Isipatana, Varanasi, okay? Uh, all these places here, Kapilavatu, Dumbini. So this is the middle land where the Buddha set foot on. All right? Now, how the Tiritri Rana got its meaning? All right? uh, this is a quick level. It's a bit technical. And this is on, on linguistic. Now, you see here, you notice it's a two fish, two mollusks. They call it snail. snail two mollusks with a fish in the middle, and then the wrap with a string. Okay? In Jain history, uh, that's how it is. Jain, Jain, uh, Jain uh, culture, all right? Uh, early Hindu, also they have things like this, okay? The two mollusks, and then the fish in between. So what happened is, uh, just now I mentioned, who did, who created this thing? It's not the king, you know? The artist, you know, right? The artisans themselves. The locksmith, the carpenter, and all. So they must be thinking, uh, where to get the idea from? When the king said, I want a symbol for Buddhism, example, uh, you think uh, how to do it, right? So they, they look for ideas and inspirations. Uh, that is where, where, where they are located. So they're from the Indus Valley, for instance, all right? And they're saying, what are the key things in this valley uh, that I can use to build this symbol? So they say, oh, okay, I've got this holy river, Yamuna and Ganga. Let's make it left and right, right? And then represented by fish, because fish uh, represents freedom, you know. To them, uh, fish can, can swim here and there, freedom, uh, okay? So they say, uh, fish represents freedom, swimming in the holy waters of Yamuna and Ganga, all right? And then they uh, position this idea to the release of suffering. Because fish is free, they can swim anywhere. They are more, some more live, uh, swimming in holy rivers. So they say they, got, they were, want to uh, turn the idea into uh, something that is released from suffering. So they came up with this idea lah, of the two molas right with the fish like that. Okay? The hero grief is a hero grief composition of fish tied to a pair of mollusks. Okay, the tree runner. It started with like that. It started like that. Now, that's where the rivers comes in. Okay. Because in Magadhi Prakit, this is what claims by this guy, as Kayana Raman. Not I say one, he say one. Okay. Ayira is fish. Dhamma is to tie. Okay. Hangi is the molas. Hangi is the molas, that means the snails. These are called hangi. Okay. These are fish, and then they tie up here. Okay, dole, pair. All right. So when, the, when they say they want to come up with a Buddhist symbol, they use the ribbus. All right. Ayira. Okay, sorry. The ribbus is Ayira becomes Aya, noble. Dhamma becomes Dhamma, teachings. Okay, dole means to form together. So the three ratna. It started from fish and mollusk and being tied up. They used the word Ayira and Dhamma, turn it into a Arya Dhamma. Okay, the noble Dhamma. And from here, the idea of noble Sangha came about. Okay. Now imagine you know, those days you cannot have a Buddha Rupa. No? When people tell you, I want a symbol that represents triple gem, how you do it. I give you a challenge right now, how you do it. Okay, so they use their own ingenuity uh, to come up with this. Uh. Okay. And again, uh, remember those days, no writing, you know, Brahmi script, not there, not there yet. All they have uh, is carving, picture carving and lines. Okay, so they had to use a lot of pictures uh, that represent near the sound of the meaning. Rebus. Just now I told you about Sharon, is it a Buddhist club? Now they use this rebus, okay, to, to create from fish and snail and to tie together and turn it into become noble dharma. So Ayira become R Arya. R I Y A. Correct, not? We call it Arya, right? Dhamma becomes Dhamma, like that. Okay? 
So the conclusion is, when the artisan use a grapheme, grapheme uh, means a rough, rough picture. Lah, okay? Close to the word Dhamma, he chose two molars tied up to a fish. Therefore, Arya Dhamma becomes Arya Dhamma, like that. That was the original meaning. Lah, okay? I'm not saying the... I'm not saying that uh, what is this? Uh, because you, some of you may be confused. Huh, they say that hey, just like you say, huh, the meaning is like that, right? A river here, river there, you know, then got, got central spine line, parallelogram. Huh? How come suddenly now huh, when you talk about pre ratna it becomes like this? What I'm saying is these artisans, just now I, early in my talk, I said there's a method, they call it rebels, isn't it? Who made the decision to use this sound? Artisans. This, this method. I'm saying that they're using this method uh, to come up with these terms, you know. Okay, so they do not decide later. Oh, these two particular fish uh, is Yamuna and Ganga. Maybe the philosopher later say like that. Uh. But to them, is that I'm going to use these two rivers to start it off with the representative by using fish. Okay, so they decided like that. So when they decided like that, then they give their own idea. Uh. Fish at that time is called Ayira. You want Arya, uh, Ayira, Arya, like that. Okay, so they decided and they became they using this, they use a sound to, to create these meanings. Okay, now um, who are these artisans? Okay, who are these artisans? Uh, this, this guy, Kalyana Rama, was had a very interesting idea. All uh, right, in the middle here, you see, uh, it's like a, they call it a palerogram, is it? Palerogram, where the four things are. Uh, or all symmetry to one another, okay? But this guy say, the central spine here is called, uh, is a parallelogram or a makara, okay? A makara, which is always four in numbers to represent the fourfold assembly uh, of monks and nuns and laymen, lay, lay women, okay? Now, this is the explanation that is offered. If you go to visit any uh, San, uh, Sanchi Amaravati, they will explain it like that. But actually, uh, when the artisan started building this, it was actually a uh, two fish here attached to a makra. All right, a makra comes from the word at makra, which is a forge blower. Comes from the word damaka, which is blacksmith, and comes from the word akamata, which is mean coiner and coinage. So these guys, these artisans created this based on what they know. They were forge blowers. They were just like, you know, they put the flame to melt the metal and they forge the metal to look like this. Then you call it makara. You get what I mean? But if you go to Sri Lanka, uh, Andarapura, okay? You go to Sanchi, you go to all these uh, famous stupas, uh, the gate on top there, you enter a gate, on top there, you see all these intricate carvings, you know. These are called makaras also. Because the makara is actually a mythical being, you know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blend between a dolphin and some any other animals. Uh. Or even could be a dugong, for instance. Okay? Or even could be a crocodile. This is called makara. Okay? But for these ancient artisans, they created this one here based on their work. Okay? They call it the forge bearers. All right? And they call it Makara. So the metal smiths were the wealth creator of those times. All right? They were akin to the writers of today. The they created these symbols. All right? And then after that, later on, once the symbols were created, it became more and more on it. Once you start something, wow, the sky's the limit already. All right, not? So you have to give, give credit to these guys, you know, right? To the, the, this, this artisan song. It started it and then it grew and grew and grew and become more and more on it. Okay. So the lesson you learn is here. <coughs> uh, any conic symbols used to convey key elements of Buddhism to neophytes. So imagine uh, you are new to Buddhism and you are not an Indian. Imagine you are Persian, you are Chinese, you are Greek, you are Afghanistan, Patan, you know, never been to India before. And then this Indian guy, you know, pass through Khyber Pass and then go to some town in Afghanistan. And then he show you this symbol. Then he asks you, what is this? 
oh, this is my king. And this one, this is this great teacher called Buddha. Oh, this great teacher, what is he? What did he do? Oh, then he start talking about Buddhism. Okay? So, any conic symbols, like the tree right now, was used to convey, right, Buddhism. <clears throat> Now, the three Ratna, even at its basic, can already outline the Trisula, which encompasses the triple gem. Okay? So, if you take a pencil, take a pencil, uh, and draw one line here, draw a line in the middle, and draw a circle. That's it. You draw already three Ratna. Great symbol uh, must be simple to draw. If you have a great symbol and very difficult to draw, it's not a good symbol. Why apple are uh, so easy to understand, so easy to see? Correct or not? Because it's easy to draw, identifiable, and if you don't have the tools to create a, a great one, use a simple pen also can do. So an outline, one, a W, a draws a line in between and a circle, and there you have it, a tree right now already, and you can start explaining away. What this, what this symbol is all about, okay? So you add in the Dharma wheel and the teachings of the Noble Path and the uh, Four Noble Truth is introduced. So you, in one symbol, you introduce everything. You introduce Triple Gem, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, okay? You introduce Four Noble Truth, you introduce a Noble A4 Path. Just now we chanted homage to Triple Gem. From here, we start to expand already. You get what I mean? This is just a one little symbol. It just introduced key ideas, key names. From there, it starts to grow. Okay? So early Buddhists had to create a tangible art to convey spiritual abstracts, which they are then create, carried far to far away lands and transferred from one to another. Transferable, transferability is very important. I pass you a coin. Then after that, this Indian guy go to Greek. He want to buy something. He passed this coin to the Greek guy. Greek guy said, what's this? This is the king of India. This is a great teacher from India. How you know? India fellow tell me. Huh? Then what's this symbol? Even this Chinese trader would be able to tell. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. There seems this view uh, got two kinds of teaching. Four Noble Truth and Noble Eightfold Path. You know, from there, lah, we start to transfer ideas already. So that time, uh, during that time, the, 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 the Silk Road was already very active, you know. So imagine a heavy traffic highway, and you go in there and start to do, trade this, do, do trading uh, using these coins. Uh. Imagine uh, how powerful uh, the message of Buddhism uh, quickly spread throughout the world. And just now, I use a Christian example. Why Christianity was hit? Because the West was rich, correct or not? During that time, India was rich. Northwest India was rich. It was hit. People come and trade. Traders go, go overseas and they were, their products were in demand, especially Indian spice. Okay? So when you have people say, you are from, uh, a trader from India, high demand. And we started using coins, right? And show off your wealth. Oh, then the idea of Buddhism became wealth widespread. So it's not, it's not a, what call this, a, 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 impossible to imagine. A, Finish, is it? One, you need time. Uh. Okay, five more minutes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Okay. So it's so hard to imagine like, like the Bamiyan valleys in Afghanistan, you know, had this giant Buddha. You know, so imagine during those times, uh, the, the Buddhists must be really, really prosperous. Uh. Okay. So I would say that the Tri Ratna was an Asokan era success because, because of his empire, the reach of his empire that linked uh, the virtually whole India, and then his idea became so entrenched in Northwest. And from this area, it spread to the whole world, okay? Um, due to him, actually, due to him, Asoka, that Buddhism became a world religion. If you compare to Jainism, during the Buddha's time, the comparable religion to Buddhist, Buddha's teaching was Jainism, you know? Jainism was equally as strong, if not stronger than Buddha, Buddhism. And they had uh, even uh, more uh, okay, structured uh, sutras, you know, structured uh, instruction for lay people. 
Do you know they had more than 110 sutras for lay people? When I ask you about sutras for lay people for Buddhism, how many can you actually tell me? The only one I can know is Sikalaw Vata Sutta. And the rest are maybe three or four only. And they're also talking about how to manage your wealth. Correct or not? Never talk about marriage, weddings, nothing. Buddhism never talk about that. And yet it became a world religion. How come? And Jainism did not become a world religion. It's still maintained as an Indian religion. And it's now become very small. But Buddhism became global religion. Global. How come? And yet there is no very little uh, teachings for lay people, you know? Right? So something must have happened during the time. The traders who spread this, this, this idea of the Buddha. Okay? Actually, there's another reason, uh, Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, okay, there's another reason actually. But this particular coin, the tree right now, uh, was the glue, you know, that let people visualize what Buddhism was all about. Who the Buddha was, what is his Dharma, what is his Sangha. That particular symbol captured the imagination of the public. Okay? So the Dharma Tutta lesson for us here is that number one, be creative. Okay? When you are restricted to say, oh, you cannot do this, then you ask, what else can I do? The Buddha said, don't make Buddha image on huh? me. This, then the Buddhists actually were very pliant. pliant. They said, okay, I follow your instruction. Don't do it. Then how? Uh, they started to explore lah, make other ways. Be adaptive. Okay? If you cannot, then how? <laughs> again, ask again how. Find ways. Find ways and, and, and try to, 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 to work out this, uh, uh, adapt to a situation and probably a new situation. We don't know. Okay? And last and not least is be immersed in Dharma and community. If you are not immersed in that community, you will not appreciate what it has. When you do not know what you have, then you do not know how to use it creatively to come up with new things. Okay? You must have roots. The roots is very important. Once you, you, are, if you are rooted to something, you know, then you say change is coming. But if you change without being rooted, then you get uprooted and you change becomes something else. You get what I mean? So you need to be rooted. So when change comes, you change. You make the change so that it, it, it becomes uh, adapted to the new situation without losing your identity. Now, this is a lesson, Dhamma Tutta lesson that we can follow from the early Buddhists. Now, this is brilliant, you know, when you talk about, say, uh, you know, icon branding, uh, creating a brand awareness, creating, what call this, an identity for your product or for your, you know, whatever like that you're doing, like, you know. There's so much lesson that you can learn from these early Buddhists, okay? And this particular symbol, okay, is computer graphic. I did it myself. Lah. And I tried to sell it as an NFT. Nobody wanted to buy it. Okay, I tried, but not a loss because of this particular symbol. I opened an OpenSea account, uh, yeah, OpenSea account where you can trade NFT. But before you can trade NFT, you must be, have a blockchain wallet, isn't it? So I go and open a MetaMask <laughs> blockchain wallet. From that time onwards, uh, I learned so much about Bitcoin and uh, blockchain. Uh. Now I know about Solana and Avalanche. And things like you're never here before, right? It opened a whole new world for me because of this tree right now. You get what I mean? Now, um, so, so what I'm saying is that uh, what we, we have to uh, take lessons from all these early Buddhists. Uh, okay? When we do Dhamma to Tawa, don't be so fixed uh, to a certain idea or certain tradition. All right? If you are rooted if you are rooted, I'm saying you must be rooted. Uh, that's why I, I, I emphasize it. You must be rooted in something. Then when change comes, you adjust, you adapt. So that you do not, you change without losing your identity. Okay? I foresee myself. Okay? I used to work in website, uh, database and things like that. Now suddenly they said the world will change because they've got this thing called metaverse, you know. Metaverse will use a lot of blockchain. Okay? And a lot of NFTs and things like that. So I have to change. I, I cannot throw away what I learned from, from a website, but I will change. Okay? But my idea is, you change for what? Change to throw away all the things? No, I change 
to go into a new platform where the world has changed. You have to accept all these things. Buddha said impermanent. You must accept. Okay. And therefore, I think when we do Dhamma Dutta, we have to also adapt. I'll be honest to say, if we don't adapt, we'll be like this. Okay. Empty temples. All right. I'm a bit worried because I go to so many places. Uh, pubs. Uh, pubs attendance is very good. But the hair gets grayer every day. So gray, my God. I said, I went there, you know. I said, oh, I'm the youngest there, you know. <laughs> what happened? I said, you know, that was really, we were young once, right? He was, he was a guitar, you know. He pioneered the use of guitar and then, you know, bringing so many young people into the temples. The young people are not doing that anymore. Why? I asked myself, why? I think we are stuck somewhere. We haven't changed. We haven't, we haven't adapted to the situation, new situations. And must be brave, okay? But in order to do that, I think we, we must identify our roots first. Uh. We must be very careful. We cannot just throw away everything, uh, the baby with the water. You cannot just do that. Identify what is need to be changed, but you look at the roots first. Once you're clear, you change, you come up with something great, like these guys here, come up with this tree right now. And lo and behold, what happened? It became a world religion. They kill it in India. Never mind. China took it up. Japan took over later. Korea took over later. And what happened? Sri Lanka became a great a Buddhist country. Then Thailand, then Cambodia, then Indonesia, Borobudur. And today we have, we have still the, the original Buddha's teaching because of all these ancestors, you see? Okay? So I think that's all for today. So, so this was uh, the fruit of research during COVID. I'm happy for COVID actually, you know. I was able to do this this is not this is one of it, you know. So many research I've done. Like for instance, do you know how the Buddha first made the rope? It was based on paddy fields. If you want, I can give another talk on that. Okay. But based on the guy, la, Brian Leftman and the Johannes Bronkosa. Okay. So some of these ideas are that we have a fixed idea on the Buddha, like him being a Sakya, noble, noble, uh, noble, uh, this, uh, noble class of people. They can give out everything and then become, you know, ascetic and then become a Buddha. That's half the story. You haven't seen the actual story yet. All right. So if you want, I will share another day. Lah, okay. So today I will stop here first and hopefully you get some idea. Lah, actually, what, how actually Buddha spread from India to China to the, to the, uh, to the, to the other parts of the world. And what actually, uh, what catalyst actually, you know, help? This is one of the catalysts. I'm not saying this is the only one. This is one of it. Okay. Okay. So thank you for your time. Uh, any questions? <laughs>